Hey there, uh, thanks for joining our session on hosting conferences and symposiums in Microsoft Teams. My name is Dwayne Hyatt. Uh, my name is Joe Gasper. We're systems administrators uh, from the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, commonly called IFAS. Uh, we've got a lot of content to cover today. We uh, plan to look over and cover questions at the end. Uh, Dwayne's going to get us started. Just a little background. Uh, prior to the pandemic shutdown, Joe and I have been traveling quite a bit to uh, our offices all over the state. We've got about 100 remote locations, and Joe and I have spent way too many miles in a car together, about <laughs> 5,500 miles driving. Yeah, exactly. Doing teams training. So, uh, but once we went virtual, you know, just like all of you, we we you know had to change a little bit, pivot, if you will, and, and start to do things a little different. So we're going to jump into our presentation and get things started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, is the problem, right? You know, we're all IT pros. You know, that's typically how things start for us. Somebody brings us a problem. They have a broken system. They've got broken software, and it's our job to come up with a solution. And we're, we're problem solvers. So we're all very familiar with what the problem is right now. Uh, we've all been living this together for the last seven or eight months, and the problem is, you know, what you see in this photo. It's empty auditoriums, empty hotel venues. You know, we can't gather in large groups anymore. The conferences that were scheduled have been canceled, or we had to learn some new technology on the fly. But I want you to think about this a little differently. Maybe not think about this as a problem. Think about it as an opportunity to teach people new skills and how to look at things through this new digital lens that we have so there are things that they didn't necessarily have to do before um and i don't want to use the word forced but in a way our our entire user base is kind of being forced to adapt to this new landscape you know so we're going to show you a few different ways that we've adapted along with our users by showing them some of the tools they have access to and a few ways that we think is you know are, are a few great ways that we think to put these tools to use in our institution and, uh, you know, maybe doing uh, this, uh, we'll start more of uh, thinking of ourselves as transform ag transformation agents, really, instead of uh, problem solvers. Um, there's this immediate problem, um, but we don't need just a, a quick fix. Uh, the users uh, need a real long lasting impact. And that's important to recognize uh, for yourself and for this journey um, we're creating for our faculty, our research agents uh, and the staff. Um, as we take them through this process of, of doing uh, conferences and symposiums and teams. So one of the themes that Joe and I stick to is whenever we do trainings with our users, we always start with why. We want to explain to them why we think it's a good idea that they use this. You know, we need to think about it from their perspective. Um, so we're going to try that here. We're going to show you five points on why uh, we would use Teams for a conference, and then we're going to show you five points on how uh, we would actually build that conference. So the first thing is we like to think of Teams as a virtual venue. So this is a, a term that we use with all the conferences that we do, and this really helps, you know, kind of connect those physical dots to the digital dots in our users mind. So Teams becomes this digital representation of, of the physical hotel that their conference probably would have been in. Um, you know, you walk into a hotel, first thing you see is a lobby, there's rooms, there's meeting going, meetings going on in these rooms. You know, we want them to think about it in from that perspective so that it feels familiar to them. They walk into this digital, you know, virtual venue and enter into the conference. So the, the Teams kind of becomes a building or a house, if you will. So the first point is all the content for the conference is in a single place. Uh, this is super convenient for our users. So again, like that hotel, Teams keeps everything inside. Uh, this reduces confusion. This sets users' expectation. And anytime they need something, it starts to become automatic. They go to Teams to find it. And like uh, when you're going to a conference, um, a real conference in a hotel, you would you wake up in the morning, uh, you take a shower, go eat a plate of bacon, grab your coffee, go down to the conference center, and that's where you'll spend the rest of your day. Um, and the same concept of us when we build a conference team, um, you know, we want that same goal. You don't need to leave the team once you're there for the day. So, Dwayne, what does this look like? Sure, we'll take you on a quick little tour of one of our recent conference teams. Um, you can see here, this is our general channel. This is our PA system. This is what we use to do announcements. 
Um, this is where we keep our users updated with what's going on uh, throughout the duration of the entire conference. You can see we've got channels all down the left side. Uh, we're going to refer to these as rooms from this point forward because when we again, when we think about this as that virtual venue, it makes more sense to the users to think about this as a, as a room that they actually walk into for a meeting. Uh, one of those rooms that we like to build for a little bit of fun is the lounge. Um, you know, one of the things that we're missing a lot of is that face to face, you know, peer connection that we normally get at a conference. So we try to accommodate that as best as we can by building a virtual lounge where people can post pictures of their dogs and spin up instant meetings and, you know, schedule meetings. Even we've had music jam out sessions and all kinds of fun stuff going on in the lounge, you know, late night uh, adult drinks, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. So it's trivia. It's, yeah, trivia, we've, we have cards against humanity, uh, all kinds of fun things in the lounge. So you got to keep it light, you got to keep it real, and uh, the users really appreciate that. As you move down, we're going to move into some of the actual session rooms. So you'll see here that we've got channel meetings scheduled inside of these rooms. Because these are channel meetings, they belong to the team, and all the conversation that happened inside of that meeting is in the team. So this is a, a big theme that you'll see as we go forward is we try to keep things contained inside of the team. And along that same mindset, we collect the PowerPoint presentations that are given throughout the conference. Um, we're big believers in using Teams' unique ability to do PowerPoint sharing. So you'll see us talk about that as we go on uh, through this as well. This is a little example of how easy it is when you're clicking a share uh, to just click browse and find the presentation that's up next and pull it up on screen for everybody. Uh, we also make the recordings available as a tab inside of each room. Um, you know, some of our conferences have a large number of guests, and so it's pretty difficult to give uh, access to those recordings and stream right now. I know that streams being revamped and stream V2 will make that a lot easier for us. Um, but we also bring those recordings down from stream, put them in a SharePoint page and make them available as a tab so people can still just click and play. Uh, we also make agendas available. So there'd be a primary agenda in the general room that shows the entire agenda. And then there's a uh, this is a SharePoint list. So we use a filtered view that's specific to each room. So we build that view and then when we bring in that SharePoint page as a tab, uh, it already has that view applied to it. So they get a unique agenda per per room. We also accommodate posters, so we're all education. We probably are familiar with virtual poster sessions, or I'm sorry, physical poster sessions, so we try to make them virtual. Uh, this was a really fun challenge for us. You know, we're trying to figure out how to, how to, you know, basically rebuild your science fair that you went to as a kid inside of Teams, and so this, is, this was a lot of fun. We, we surfaced these in different ways. Um, we, we sometimes we build a room per poster depending on how many there are. And so this is an example of a SharePoint page with a, another list that includes hyperlinks that would take you straight to that uh, author's room so that you could conversate with them or have a uh, meeting with them. And then Joe built some pretty cool stuff. I'll show you next. So some things uh, that we like to use again is really important to bring in SharePoint pages and take advantage of those and bring those in as tabs. Uh, we'll bring those posters in, um, highlighted uh, content web part, nice uh, thumbnail view, very easy to kind of view and access those. We do a little sometimes tweak and you can't see it there for some privacy, but we'll do a little metadata uh, modification so the name of the uh, author shows up on those um, areas. Next thing we do, kind of depending on the quantity of um, posters we have, but for every one of these, we've done uh, virtual spaces for them using SharePoint spaces. Um, this conference had uh, about 150 posters. We, we didn't spend the time to put all of them in. Uh, it'd be great if there was a kind of an automated method to do that. But this one had a number of um, kind of uh, top level posters and uh, some winners. So we brought those into their own uh, virtual venue. Uh, this has really been a, a great feedback, really positive. People really uh, are impressed and, and love to see that. It gives them, again, closer to the feeling of them being able to walk up to the poster that they used to uh, in, in the real world. That's the theme also, is we try to, again, make that connection. Uh, we find it makes people more comfortable when we can bring in some familiar things, but also do some cool things, you know, with technology gives us some extra advantages. So the next point that we're going to cover is creating a clear conference structure. That's that's what we feel like using Teams does. So we're going to jump into this example. 
Yeah, so this seems to be a not uncommon setup for online conferences, academic conferences. Uh, it's a nicely formatted scrolling page of links. Uh, again, not uncommon to see that. Um, each one of those links is an individual registration um, because of security. Um, but say you're interested as an attendee in several tracks over several days, maybe a fourth track you're sort of interested in. There's a lot of registrations you have to go through. Uh, with Teams, um, that meeting can be contained inside the event, um, all those meetings. Um, for the attendee experience, this also means there's less registration process. Uh, like you can use a single online event service. We'll use Microsoft Teams to collect registration data. Um, users don't have to end up searching their email every day, trying to remember where, where the link was to that web page. You're not looking for a PDF attachment uh, to find the agenda and what meetings to join. To join. Uh, instead of you know, several apps or windows to attend a session, they can be fully contained in that team and really have a consistent, uh, repeatable and memorable experience for the attendees. Yep, consistency is key. So our next why point would be we don't create these transient meeting silos. So that previous example had, you know, 40 or 50 individual meetings. And when you do that, you end up with, you know, where do I get the recording? Where do I get the chat? Where do I get the files that were shared? Like, wh where do those files even really go? Um, were those files that were, you know, did I upload a copy of the file or did I upload a version that we can collaborate on? You know, it can be kind of tricky. So we feel like it's really important to bring all these things into one centralized structure because, you know, those 40, those 40 meetings, you've created 40 islands, you know, of data. And it's really difficult to get all that stuff put back together in a way that's searchable. You know, you want to build this knowledge network that people can go back and reference and creating 40 silos doesn't, doesn't achieve that. The next point is there's no time limit on engagement. Um, this is, this is really cool. So this, again, referencing that previous point of, of meeting silos, when you bring everything into one place, you don't have any limit on engagement. And so these are some analytics from one of the conferences that we recently did. And, uh, I thought this was really cool to see. So you can tell from the chart here, pretty much when the conference happened, right? We had the big spike, but then look at a week or two after there's still people coming into this team. There's still people looking at stuff. There's still people checking on stuff, you know, and that's really cool to see because a physical conference, even, you know, you go to uh, Orlando for four or five days, you walk around, you know, for four or five days, you get on your plane or your car and you go back home. You might have made some connections or took some photos or something like that, but really going back and digging into the conversations that you had, you can't do that. Um, so and so this, take, this is taking cool. photos, you said that's something that uh, like for our poster session, some feedback we had was um, someone like to take uh, pictures of the posters um, so they can remember them and, and go back and look at them. Now they, they're like, this is, this is awesome. I wish all of our poster sessions were done virtually. I can go back and access those posters now. Um, I can actually go back and chat with the authors anytime now. Um, so it's really been positive feedback for this, this method. Our last why point, but you know, maybe one of the hardest ones to really explain sometimes is the A1 license for education is, is free. Um, and this is, this is great. You know, this is a su serious benefit to education. And, and like I said, it's hard to convey this, um, but we've seen some interesting changes in the industry that Joe's gonna talk about. Um, you know, we've, we've seen um, some people who've approached us to try to do Teams uh, as, a, as a venue virtually for these conferences. We're looking at other vendors, perhaps um, outside, and they were getting back, to, you know, twenty-five thousand dollars for a twelve-hour rental of some type of service. And once that service was over and the rental was done, that that information was was lost. Um, so taking advantage of some of these services we already have um, is is why we're seeing uh, people continuing to to come to us to to put on some conferences. So now that we've gone through uh, a lot of the why we would want to use Teams, we're going to step into the world of how we've actually used Teams. So going along that same lines of the virtual venue, we're going to show you how to build that virtual venue. Uh, so what we consider the first, you know, 
foundational step is understanding your stakeholders goals. And this sounds kind of cliche, but you really got to ask questions. You got to understand these organizations because there's a lot going on. Um, some of these things have been going on longer, you know, twice as long as you've been alive. You know, one of our recent ones, this was their 133rd annual meeting. Um, and so when you look at it like that, it really kind of makes you feel kind of small. You know, this has been going on for a really long time. We really need to uh, ask some serious questions about this. Let's see as uh, so I'm not going to go over all these individually, but I just I'm going to drop down to the bottom and, and, and point one out. So do you expect there to be 300 more, or more than 300 in a session? Because that's going to change things a little bit. You know, I just told you everything's free, but if you need to use a live event, you are going to need to have the organizer to have an A3 license. Uh, so that is the one thing that might have some sort of cost associated with the solution. So it, you know, you've got to find that ahead of time. Find out if you're going to need to leverage that utility. It is really amazing. Uh, you know, we're using it now to broadcast this to you. So um, again, you know, is there going to be a general session or, or a keynote speaker? You know, it may not exceed 300, but maybe a live event is the proper tool because it prevents any kind of potential interruptions from the audience. And do you have any pre-recorded videos? Uh, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think almost every single one we've done had some sort of pre-recorded video they wanted to play to the audience, right? Yeah, from from our keynotes to the opening sessions to the closing sessions. Sometimes there's award ceremonies and some things like that they, that they have to do differently now, and they'll they'll pre-record those. So yeah, we've had to we've had to deal with those. Um, so it's really important to look at. Uh, the traditions of these conferences and really talk to the stakeholders and understand their their common functions. Um, maybe there's their, their consistent learning tracks and organizational structure to really flesh out how to build this team out. We're going to show you two tricks. We're not going to spend a lot of time on live events, but there's two things I wanted to show you um, <clears throat> that we thought were, were interesting. So the first one is when you run into those situations with pre-recorded videos, what do you do? Um, so this is an example of a meeting that I was in just last week. Um, a gentleman shared a video and he, you know, pulled up media player on his computer, shared a screen, and this is kind of what you get. So you can tell the frame rate here is pretty low, uh, probably in the five frames a second type range. Um, and so it's, it's doesn't come across great. And a lot of times the video that they're sharing isn't just a slideshow or a pre-recorded PowerPoint. It's something nice like this with some fast motion in it. So we have a different method that we use for doing this. So this is an example of another video uh, using our, uh, I'm not gonna say our technique, but one we've learned about. Um, and this is using a free tool called OBS. Um, that's actually what we're using right now to do our tricky little uh, cameras at the bottom of the screen, but you should notice the frame rate here is is significantly better. Um, and it would appear that Teams prioritizes the feed that's coming through your webcam. So what you can do with OBS is you can open up a virtual camera and you can take whatever you put on your OBS stage and you can pipe it through that virtual camera. Um, this actually is included in the latest version of OBS, version 26. They started including virtual camera as a part of the base installation. There's a few other things that you might need to do with uh, audio to reroute virtual audio back through your microphone so that, that you can loop in the audio of the of the video as well. Um, we have that documented in this PowerPoint slide, so there will be in the notes section, um, there will be some notes in there about how to accomplish that. Joe, what's our next serious, you know, like, uh, I guess our two main Two main yeah. points. Yeah, so I mean, that was that was a good technical tip. And another one was more of a, a person tip. Um, we, you know, for successful live events, um, really what we found is having a good detailed script um, for smooth transitions between speakers. Uh, when you've got 45 transitions scheduled, you really need to write those down. Um, as a producer, it helps you queuing up, you know, the next content, uh, who to ping in the chat as the next speaker, make sure they're ready, remind them to unmute, those kind of things. But you need to have that that list of what's what's happening. Um, and uh, and once you get access to all these recordings, um, be sure to watch Jeremy Miller's session uh, from earlier in the week. Uh, he did a, a deeper dive on on live events. So hopefully we get a chance to watch that. So moving down our list, uh, the next step would be build a demo team, right? We're all IT pros. We all have a lab environment, right? Some of us call it our production environment, but build yourself a demo team. It's super cheap to get a lab environment in teams. Just 
build a new team. It's free, doesn't cost anything. Uh, so this is one of our demo teams. Um, there's a few things that we like to do to kind of set these apart. First of all, we'll watermark it. You know, we'll watermark the team logo with you know some sort of demo you know indicator on it. Uh, we also put demo in the name. The reason why we do that is because we actually bring some of the stakeholders and key players into this team for practice sessions and you know. Uh, the first time we did this, people were confused and they went to the wrong team. Uh, you know, they didn't go to the production team to do stuff. So we want to go ahead and make sure that they know that that's, you know, they're in the right place. Uh, this also gives you an opportunity to play around with channels. You know, so again, you need to communicate with those stakeholders, figure out what it is that they want. How do they want it to look? You know, you may build a bunch of channels and they may not like the name, you know, and again, like we said, some of these events have been going on for 100 years. They have very well established names they're not going to deviate much. So you have to, you know, make teams fit. Um, we also like to use emojis when we name our teams because that allows you to keep things grouped together. Uh, so experiment with those. You know, Teams is going to sort your channels or rooms in alphabetical order. But if you have several rooms that are of the same type, you know, use an emoji prefix to kind of keep them clumped together. That makes it a lot easier for the users to find. Um, we've got a few bacon channels, bacon, bacon, bacon teams even actually, right, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> um, moving over, uh, you'll see here, every time you rename a channel, it posts a status message to that channel. Um, and so you don't want to do this in your production team. You don't want a giant wall of spam of how you were trying to figure out how to make this team look. Um, so work that out in the demo team. Let the stakeholders look at it. They might not like the emoji that you used. You know, and, and one pro tip about this is emojis actually have an order that they sort in. So if you change the emoji, it's it's going to reposition where that room shows up in the list. So you you have to kind of play with it and just find out you know where it, where it goes. Um, we've kind of come across a few that now that we know how they sort, we kind of stick to those core ones uh, and don't deviate too much. Um, but yeah, that's that was fun to find out. So it also gives you uh, a place to practice. So we have practice sessions with our facilitators and event staff. Um, you know, they're going to come in here, they're going to run up, you know, spin up some meet now meetings, they're going to practice what they're going to do, run through the whole motions of it. And you don't want, you know, 12 meetings showing up in the actual production team where the real meetings are going to take place. Um, it just kind of makes it look ugly. And sometimes and, uh, we encounter issues with guests. Um, so practice as a guest, sign into your demo team as a guest. Um, this is an example of quick polls not working. Um, so you really want to kind of experiment as an attendee in that demo team, try out all the tabs, bring in all the content you're thinking of using and put them through their paces. Yeah, we've we've run into some really fun surprises when it comes to bringing external guests into uh, teams. So that the metrics we showed you from that previous conference contained about 1300 external guests that we had to bring into our tenant. So that's, that was fun. Um, so again, since we rely heavily on PowerPoint sharing inside of Teams, I mean, I can't stress this enough. This is a really, really cool trick. Um, and we're gonna reference it several times as we go throughout this presentation. Um, but since we're doing that, we need to collect the PowerPoint files ahead of time. So we actually use the demo team as kind of a repository of where we put those. Um, and because we're using PowerPoint online, we have to, we have to think about things a little differently. Um, we have to check them for issues. We have to check and make sure they're not doing anything too wild inside of it. You know, it is PowerPoint online, so it does render a little bit differently than the PowerPoint desktop app. Um, it, you know, it's mostly compatible, but you need to run through these and, and make sure they're okay. And, and the other thing is, you know, our users are not used to having to worry about how big their PowerPoint presentation is. When they walk up to a podium and plug their thumb drive into, uh, you know, a kiosk that's connected to the projector, the audience consumes that presentation with their eyes. You know, there's no bandwidth there. There's nothing to worry about. And so I, I don't fault them for this, but you know we kind of do a, I guess you'd call it a white glove service, if you will, where we're going through these presentations and we're optimizing them and bringing the file size down as much as we can. Um, but it's something we need to teach our users in this new world that we live in. It's something that they have to take into consideration. Um, so you see here, we've got an 86 meg PowerPoint. You know, that's a pretty good size for a PowerPoint. You know, the one that we're actually running right now might be about that. Um, but with a little bit of work, we can drop it to seven and there's no visual change. And so how do we do that? Well, we have to take a look at the PowerPoint file itself. Um, keep an eye out for embedded videos. You know, those are big space hogs. 
uh, you know, there's some things you can do to optimize those. But one thing that we found with PowerPoint Online that is a little frustrating is, you, you know, you can't, you have to set the video to play automatically. Um, so if you look up at the top, uh, it says, you know, start automatically. You don't want it to start in click sequence because if you do that, every single person in the audience has to click play on their own. It's not going to play synchronously for all of them. There's a, another bonus uh, we're talking about embedded uh, things inside of your, your PowerPoint slide decks is um, hyperlinks are active in these slides for the attendees. So say you want to provide a link to additional information in an extended length YouTube video. Maybe you just show a portion of it. You can give them the full length video link, uh, maybe a link to a poll. Um, those attendees can actually click right on the right on that slide, right on that hyperlink and access that content. And again, you know, taking it back to this is a different perspective they have to have. They have to think about things a little bit differently, just like they don't have to worry about how big the PowerPoint file you know, used to not have to worry about it. And now they do. Well, now there's these new these new methods of engagement. You know, you, if you had an audience, you can put up a QR code. But when you're in a meeting, people can just click on a hyperlink with their mouse. And that that is super cool. Uh, so to find out if you've got videos in your PowerPoint, the easiest thing is, is as soon as you open it, go to the File Info tab, and it's going to tell you right away. If you see these buttons that say Optimize or Compress Media, there's video somewhere. Uh, go find the video and see what it looks like. If it's a video that they've shrunk down to a, a four-inch square or something like that, it doesn't need to be 1080p. It probably doesn't even need to be 720. So take a look at it. you got to spend a little bit of time, um, but... PowerPoint has some great compression tools built right into it. So you can just, you know, pull this up, find the video, hit compress at 720, see what it looks like. Uh, out of all the presentations that we've modified, we have never had a single person complain about the quality of the video or the picture before. And speaking of pictures, uh, you know, one neat thing about PowerPoint is when you bring a photo in and you crop it, PowerPoint never deletes the perimeter that you cropped out. It stays there. Um, if you resize it, it keeps the original size. Uh, so this gets pretty pretty wild sometimes. It's a nice feature that PowerPoint does, but when you're trying to optimize an online presentation, you know it kind of works against you a little bit. So if you click a picture inside of the uh, PowerPoint deck, uh, go to compress pictures, you'll see that you have the ability to delete cropped areas of the picture. You can uncheck that top box and it will go through the entire PowerPoint presentation and optimize all the pictures. We usually set it to the web uh, resolution, which is totally fine. Again, we have never had a single person say that the quality of the photos and their optimized PowerPoint were low. Every once in a while, you run into some crazy ones. So, <laughs> what happens, Joe? Yeah, um, sometimes there might be a file that um, doesn't compress properly, or or maybe you're just curious what what is going on. Who who handed you this huge file? This one's 520 megs. Um, well, there's a trick. Uh, your PowerPoint, actually your Excel and your Word files are all zip files. Um, so you can make a copy of that PowerPoint, uh, rename it to .zip, unzip it, and dive into uh, the media folder. And there you're going to find uh, all the pictures uh, and uh, any videos in, in that content. And this one uh, we opened up, there's 50 meg 4K TIFF files in there. Um, run compression, very, very friendly process to do that 520 becomes 11. And uh, they definitely didn't need a 4K image. They're down to 400 you know, by 600, 400 by 200 because of that clipping capability. Um, now that file in PowerPoint sharing is only 10.5 you know, 10 megs, much easier to, for all the attendees. Yeah, the compression, you know, running compression takes seconds. Um, it takes longer to re-upload the changes in the file than it does to run the compression. So definitely worth it. Easy, easy thing to do. Um, so after you do all this and, you know, we keep talking about PowerPoint online and its its benefits, uh, I wanted to show you a, a part from a Microsoft Mechanics video. So Jeremy Chapman did a video on the benefits of using PowerPoint sharing in Teams. And we, you know, again, we're all in this new virtual world where everything we do is an online meeting, right? So we have to take into consideration the bandwidth that we're consuming because not everybody has fiber, not everybody has 100 meg, not everybody has 25 meg. Um, so you have to really take this into consideration and be conscientious of how much bandwidth you're actually consuming. Um, he has a great video. I'm not going to go into it too much, uh, but he actually shows the entire process. He shows screen sharing with the same PowerPoint presentation versus 
PowerPoint sharing. He does uh, network traces, you know, uh, uh, graphs and stuff from both the presenter side and the receiver side. Uh, I definitely check it out. We're going to drop a link in the chat for you here. Uh, we made a short URL for it. Um, but again, this is a Microsoft Mechanics video that kind of uh, highlights the benefits of using uh, PowerPoint sharing in Microsoft Teams. So our next step is once we've got the demo team, we're going to train facilitators and moderators. Um, so we kind of showed off how we do that in the demo team. Uh, that's the place where we actually do the training. Uh, my advice would be offer multiple training sessions. This is the only synchronous training that we do, the only face-to-face, -face, you know, virtually face-to-face -face training that we do. Um, we want to make sure that they're comfortable, not only with the technology, but their roles in actually moderating, moderating a session. Um, and so, and, and people are invested in this. They want to make sure their conference was run well. And so it's not uncommon for us to see people repeat these trainings. You know, they come to the one on Tuesday and they come back to the one on Wednesday. Uh, they want to make sure this works. So we kind of identify some roles that they do. Um, you know, we, we train our facilitators to actually pull the PowerPoint presentation up on behalf of the, the actual person who's presenting it. So. This means that we only need to train 20 people on the, the ins and outs of sharing in Teams. We don't have to train every single presenter out there. So they pull the PowerPoint up for them, hand them the virtual clicker. Uh, another facilitator promotes them to the presenter role. We've got somebody muting people who might be you know, making a little bit of noise. Uh, we know hard mute just came out, but we don't use it in these situations because we, we have people who want to be able to ask questions at the end of each session. Um, you know, and we've got somebody keeping time. So we we try to uh, we try to divide these roles up into easy chunks that they can that they can use. And that that really helps with the attendee experience side too. Is you know some of these sessions can run a run a few hours. Um, we've had some that have had fifteen or twenty back to back presenters. Uh, Ten minutes, two minute break in between. Um, that can be a lot of fumbling around trying to share a regular screen or an app sharing if each one of those people are trying to do that in, in any uh, you know conferencing app. Uh, so having the facilitators be able to have that PowerPoint ready and basically the, the presenter walks up onto this virtual stage and they're handed a clicker um, has really made these uh, much smoother sessions. And we tell them they only need to know three things on how to present at one of our conferences and teams. That's how to turn on your camera, how to unmute your microphone, and how to click the take control button of the PowerPoint presentation. Everything else is handled for them. So the next thing is, is we've trained our facilitators and our moderators. Now we need to set the attendees' expectations. We need to provide some sort of training for them. Um, so this is the asynchronous training component that we use. Uh, we're big fans of video. We use video quite a bit. Uh, we goof off with video. Um, it's a lot of fun. And we do training videos internally at UF, and so we thought it made sense to do one here. So we, we use OBS for this. It's Again, it's because it's free. There's tons of tools out there you can use. You can use PowerPoint to record your screen, Stream to record your screen. Um, OBS does a great job of letting me switch through windows and scenes and stuff like that, so it's, it's my preference. Um, but that's our tool that we use. And then another free tool that you can use for editing it after the fact is just the Windows Photos app. It's actually pretty decent at splicing clips, splitting clips, you know, trimming things, putting things together in a certain order, uh, text overlays, all kinds of things. And in the training, we really start at the beginning. We assume that the, the, the conference attendee has no knowledge of Teams whatsoever. So we're going to walk them through downloading the app, logging into the app, you know, are they a guest? Do they need to accept a guest invitation? What's that invitation going to look like? Uh, how are they going to join a meeting? How do they know when a meeting is running? You know, they don't know what channels are, so it could be completely foreign to them. So we, we cover all these bases to make sure that they that they know what to expect. Uh, we've had pretty decent results with this. So we put these videos on YouTube because it's easy. It's the easiest place for access. It doesn't require any login or anything like that. You can do an unpublished link or something uh, if you're worried about somebody seeing super secret info about your conference. But um, we, we've had uh, 1,300, I think, Joe, external guests or 1,280. For that one, yes. That range, yeah. Um, and so you can see here that this particular video had 1,155 views. So we had pretty good results with actually getting them to watch this video, and that ultimately led to less tickets, less support items, less requests. You know, they were able to get in. So the last thing that you'll do is you'll actually build the production team. 
Um, so we're going to take you through some of the steps on how we build a production team and just, you know, this is where it gets nerdy. <laughs> All right, Joe. Yeah. Well, um, you know, once we have those finalized uh, channel names and emojis and the quantity of maybe posters and breakout rooms, you know, we use a little PowerShell to build out the production team's channels. Um, we prefer to name the channels uh, without the emoji and then rename them, add in the emoji. It keeps the SharePoint URLs free of that a character. Um, it's just a preference. I think it might be confusing to the attendees if we ever sort of expose that SharePoint URL to them. Um, you can definitely have, uh, you know, triple bacons up in your URL if you want to. Um, but with a lot of manual work. It actually you know, renders emojis in the address <laughs> bar, we found out. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, with a you know with a lot of manual work um, you know we're we're building that demo team from building that demo team uh, we use that code and ensure we've got a clean um, you know channels clean of a bunch of renames and things like that and changes to that just keep the changes to that production team uh, to its minimum minimal so um, to feed that to PowerShell uh, we use an Excel uh, template um, for creating those team channels. Um, we can generate multiple poster channels as needed. Excel handles those emojis nicely. Uh, we're using an Excel file. This is something think down the road we might be able to just uh, hand to uh, you know an organizer or facilitator, uh, get some other people you know a little easier to work through this process uh, you know with us for that. So so once you get the team set up, um, we start working on adding the attendees, uh, the members, and the guests. Um, Again, we automate that. Um, we add the our, our own tenant members with uh, standard Microsoft Teams uh, module PowerShell, PowerShell module. Um, but another major automation thing we got to work through sometimes is bulk invites. We have a lot of external guests. So one of our conferences, again, had around 1,300 guests who were external to our tenant. Um, we use the Azure AD module for that to send out those bulk invites. Um, one thing uh, that is a tip that um, took us a second time to really kind of figure out how to how to get that worded properly, but during your registration process and collecting information, try to get uh, the person's Unity ID, EID, NetID, et cetera. Those kind of authentication accounts from the attendees really helps with a little smoother uh, invite uh, around getting them added into the into the into the team. So there's a little bit of uh, how many aliases there were. <laughs> yeah, a lot of aliases and things like that. So a lot of vanity emails and, and stuff like that to work around. Um, I think that's supposed to be improving down the road, um, but for, for us, that's what we kind of encountered there. So with some little additional code, you can get the status of your invites after you've sent them out, see who's you know accepted them. Um, there's a there's a pending acceptance status uh, that we look for that we know who you know who hasn't actually accepted yet. Um, so a little slight change of code, we resend those invites out to those um, who are impending. We get a little closer to the conference start, you know, kind of once a day we start sending out those invites. Uh, we like to have, in this case, with with uh, a lot of external people, we like to have, you know, say five days uh, out to start adding them. Um, we're working with that number of people. Um, when you're um, running the invite code, one thing that we did also to kind of help with the acceptance of these invites is um, had our uh, conference organizer, someone who is well known to the attendees, actually run the code and do the invites because that, um, that invite is going to come with their name in it. It's going to come with their little pro profile picture. And that's important because of how these invites look uh, when they're arriving in the attendees inboxes. Um, it's yeah, not a very uh, inviting invitation. Um, so prior to sending these out, again, we recommend uh, send out uh, an email saying just a heads up, expect to see this invite coming soon, you know, through your registration process or something like that. Maybe give an example of what they're going to see because they're going to receive this email and it says things like, you know, block future invitations, bad actors, proceed with caution. So a lot can go wrong there. And that's probably our number one support issue we had with the guests is I, I can't find my invitation. And uh, most of the time it was just sitting in the user spam or maybe blocked, uh, you know, in their email reports. Um, often it's just sitting, it's just sitting there. So um, if you have a few dozen guests, you might consider adding them manually because they have a much better onboarding email, as you can see there on the right. That's a lot more inviting and professional looking email. That'd be great to somehow be able to produce those kind of uh, emails for, for bulk invites. Um, but there's, if you- use the Microsoft Teams PowerShell module included an invite guest command. Uh, so, 
<laughs> that'd be great. Um, but if you still have problems cutting through all those spam filters and things like that, um, if you have access to and you can get into the Azure AD portal, there's a there's a manual way to resend that invitation. Um, that invitation will look like it comes from the person who presses that that resend invitation button. Um, but you also, when you do that, you're going to get an invitation link um, that you can then directly email or message or get it to that person in some other manner, get it past the spam blockers, and that'll help get them added to the team. Um, we had to do that just just a couple of times uh, for for a few people. So, but that's the last of our major sections on the build out. Um, now we're going to go on to a few collected tips we've compiled, kind of running these events. Yep, get your pencils out. Uh, no, we're not going to talk about all these. Um, we're going to talk about two or three of them, though. Um, so these are things that we just learned as we went through this. Uh, again, these are all annotated in this slide deck in the notes section on this slide. Um, so you'll be able to download that after this uh, if you want to read about all these things. But these are things that we found out that were, you know, you just couldn't search these online. Just weird stuff that you know, it was just difficult. Um, so it came from experience. We learned, you know, painfully through some of these things. Uh, but the, a few things that we want to talk about. Number one is we learned by the third conference, start using a service account when you schedule channel meetings, because uh, it is really painful to have to shuffle and, 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 and you know, juggle all these various people. Like, who's the meeting organizer? Who can promote people? Who, who owns the recording? Um, so use a service account, because unfortunately, in a channel meeting, Microsoft Teams does not allow you to pre-specify a presenter. You can only say only me. Um, and so we don't ever allow that in a conference setting because, you know, people interrupt screen shares all the time, uh, do all kinds of weird stuff. So we always have to set it to only me. Uh, and then we use this service account again with a free A1. And we have, you know, four, three or four IT staff who are, who are you know, kind of, uh, facilitating this entire event, all running it as a web app. So you can make it a web app inside of Edge or something like that. And uh, you can actually go in and start meetings. You can end meetings. You can promote people. You can download attendance reports. You can do all those things that can only be done by the event organizer, uh, which is a little frustrating, but this is, you know, this is what we got. So this is the workaround we came up with. Um, well, Joe, what's your favorite on this list? Uh, one is our, our use of, uh, of SharePoint inside of the uh, inside of the team. So uh, SharePoint list page for team links. Um, so like if you need to compile or use hyperlinks to teams objects, like to channels or to posts, meetings, uh, files, um, we use it for a, a poster index. So people can uh, easily jump into the poster rooms. Uh, we like to place those on, on SharePoint pages or lists. Um, and bring those in as a tab using the SharePoint app. Um, so often hyperlinks to Teams objects like on a, on a website tab or maybe a PDF you're using, those some can have a tendency to launch the user out of Teams, out into a web browser, only to be redirected back into the team. So um, you like to make a good use of, you know, SharePoint in this conference team to try to keep those folks in the team and not, not kind of bouncing them out and back in. Yeah, that is a jarring experience and confusing to the end user to have their browser say, do you want to open this in Teams? Or, I thought I was in Teams, you know? So yeah, that's a great a great one. Keep those things inside of native, uh, native SharePoint-y type things. So uh, here's some stats from the last four conferences that we've done that, that we gathered that we thought was, you know, interesting. Um, you know, cumulatively, it represented 900, uh, or I'm sorry, 293 years of meetings. You know, like I said, we had one that was, this was their 133rd annual meeting. Uh, we had another that was 105th annual meeting. Um, and again, that just really makes you feel small, but it was really humbling and really, you know, we were really grateful to be a part of that process that they trusted us to do this uh, with them. Uh, they trusted the product that we selected to, to pull it off. Uh, and in the end, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. We have to think about those. Um, those were running and have not missed a meeting prior, you know, through the Spanish uh, flu, through World War One, World War Two, those kind of things. So again, as Dwayne said, it's been a real honor to kind of facilitate these and, and make them able to continue. Uh, if these conferences would have been held in person, um, we understand that they were canceled. There was no chance of a physical meeting. 
uh, the total cost would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half million dollars for the venue, the travel, the expenses that each of our ag agents would have to spend to attend the conference. So that was a pretty staggering number as well. Uh, and probably with a lot of budget cuts and things like that going on right now, again, that it, it's in one more place that uh, helps extend what we're going through, but still be able to provide, you know, the same um you know, environment for them and, and get them through these teams conferences. So kind of one more thing that um, we've been talking about why teams this this whole time too is you can see there's almost about 150 individual meetings, almost 400 presentations. Um, just kind of imagine scaling that out and that many individual potentially standalone siloed meetings. Um, how do you bring all that back together in some coherent manner? Um, We've got four teams uh, that this is done. And so basically at this point, we basically can give four links to get into that content, get back to that knowledge, um, get back to where those scientists, researchers were sharing what they were doing. Uh, much uh, much more compact and easier for them to, again, as we saw um, in one of the slides Dwayne had, is they can keep coming back to this and use that information. Um, Part of, uh, I'm sure a lot of our, our missions, our universities is to take that knowledge and share it um, and make it accessible and putting it into these teams, it continues to do that for us. This also makes you wonder about the future and uh, we realize that we, we just hit our time, so we're going to race through these last two slides. Um, it makes you wonder about the future. You know, we've had comments from a lot of our customers that say, uh, even if we go back to in person next year, we still want you to do that virtual poster thing. Um, so it really makes you wonder, like, are we going to do hybrid moving forward? Like, do we still need to make this a part of it? So just, you know, kind of get your gears turning and, and, and think about what is this going to look like next year? Um, am I still going to have to have a crew that knows how to do a virtual conference to bring people in? You know, look at the attendance increase. We had an 84% average increase in attendance just by going virtual. Even this conference we're doing right now, the Hyatt conference has seen, a, uh, I think, probably a record number of attendees. Uh, you can get to all the things that we've referenced throughout this entire presentation at our GitHub repo. Uh, we have a link to the PowerPoint presentation there, as well as all the PowerShell code and, and kind of a wall of links of little tidbits of information for things that we use. Uh, Joe can drop a link to that. We have a shortened link for that as well that we'll drop into the meeting chat for you now. If you want to connect with us, uh, here's some connection info for us. Uh, LinkedIn is, you know, we're really active on LinkedIn. That's one of our preferred you know, professional social media platforms. Uh, you can also email us if you still use email instead of Teams messaging, but, uh, you know, scan the code, click the link, uh, hit us up on LinkedIn. Um, we, you know, love to love hear from you, some feedback, uh, how you're doing these, that'd be great to know. Uh, so I realize we're really, I mean, we, we ran over our time. Uh, uh, I'm going to look at some of the questions and see if there's anything that we can answer. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, please go ahead and put them in the chat box um, and we'll see if we can answer them. Uh, and I guess we'll, should we give them a sneak peek, Joe? Sure. We, uh, just like every other nerd on the planet, uh, we decided to launch a podcast. So it's coming soon. We'll be uploading our first episode in the very near future. If you haven't noticed throughout the entire theme of this, we like Star Trek. So um, if again, we'll watch the chat for your, uh, for your questions. Uh, looks like we have a few in there. Yes, uh, definitely using um, OBS right now. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, pointing that out, uh, Kate. Um, how do you manage access? Are all attendees given accounts in your tenant? Um, so for um, three of our conferences, primarily we're um, university are in our tenant. Um, so no problem there um, using their, their tenant accounts. Uh, for the others, we just use uh, guest accounts. So no need to create accounts for these, for these folks to bring them in and manage them into these conferences. Um, Here's one, and do you have a custom conference template that you use to create new teams for this purpose, or do you build each new team individually using the standard templates that come with teams? Um, we use the other template, uh, where, you know, obviously an academic tenant, um, mm -hmm. and then after we build it, then we use the PowerShell code uh, that Joe showcased earlier, along with the Excel template uh, feeder file that actually builds everything out. Um, a few things we didn't talk about real quick that we try to do in that as well is channel moderation. We turn channel moderation on in all the channels and the general channel to keep things clean. 
you definitely want to go in and set the settings on the team to prevent members from deleting channels and things like that. Um, so we handle a lot of that in an automated way. Yeah. Uh, one more thing, we sometimes we add a, a private channel for um, the facilitators or moderators, you know, sort of like a uh, presenters lounge you might have at a larger conference. And that's a place for us to kind of chat back and forth during that conference uh, with those people that are helping us to kind of run those events. Uh, another question here around the around the emojis. So um, yeah, we don't like the emojis also in the in the SharePoint URL. So again, we will create the team without those initially, the channels, the rooms without the emoji, and then we'll rename them. And currently uh, the SharePoint uh, channel it doesn't get renamed with that. Um, so it keeps the SharePoint uh, URL clean from having that emoji in it. It doesn't break, it does work. Uh, we currently kind of feel like it, it just can cause some confusion. So we like to keep it out of there. Uh, so question, are you providing access to these conferences in perpetuity? Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we don't really see a need to delete it. Um, you know, the data's there. Uh, one thing that we do is we uh, every folder that we store presentations in is set to read only. Um, so we feel comfortable keeping it there. Um, there are all things that are shared anyway. A lot of our presenters actually really appreciate that because they say, you know, well, if I give a presentation, someone walks up and says, can I get a copy of your slides? Uh, they already have it. It's all already there. All they have to do is, is know where to look to get it. So yeah, we keep those, we keep those up. We don't have any plans right now on shutting those down. Yeah. This is a good one, Joe. Do you see a possibility of a hybrid model using face-to-face -face along with teams for continuity? That's definitely something that um, we are, we know we're going to get asked. I think we've already been basically asked how to maintain some of this in that way. Um, and going forward uh, so far, um, we've been very successful with this team's model, so we'd continue to do that. But how to bring in that, that uh, Hybrid model is something we we need to we need to figure out and and how to do that. I am not seeing any more questions, so yeah. I think we got them all. We are over by seven minutes anyway. So uh, thanks I'll for staying with us today and for us on the East Coast going a little late into the day. Appreciate this. Uh, this has been a really um, very interesting, you know, few months uh, putting these on, switching from sysadmins into basically event coordinators and figuring uh, what that means. Um, there's uh, some good gifts out there of herding cats, Dwayne, sometimes I think that's appropriate. Um, but uh, unmute, Dwayne. <laughs> Oh, sorry. He said herd, herding cats, not herding cat, like herding yes. them. Like, yeah, like, yeah, no, no. Penguin no. cats. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very you much, guys, everybody, for your time. You guys Appreciate must be it. happy yeah. that I had uh, CC turned on in uh, Klingon, huh? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was happy about that. Was, we right, do that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. thank you very much, guys. Thanks, okay. Scott. Thanks, Microsoft team. Uh, and thanks for the folks who are putting this, this conference on. Really uh, appreciate being part of it. Yeah.